special guest, k musician, artist, joining us today. Um, many of you recognize him, but uh, for those of you that don't know quite enough about him, um, let me just read this to you. It was inevitable that from the moment of his birth, his life would be filled with wall-to-wall -wall music. Um, in fact, his birth certificate, on his birth certificate, his father listed the family religion as musician. Is, is that true? Yes. Okay. And as a young child, he watched his father's concerts from the side of the, sides of the stage. When he was six years old, his father gave him his first guitar, which was a Fender Music Master. But it wasn't until he was about age 12 that he began to really show a serious interest in making music. But once he began listening to the radio and became influenced with artists like the Beatles, Queen, Jimi Hendrix, ACDC. Um, Van Halen. Van Halen. We will go there as well. Uh, and you know, and that's a great point because like other uh, artists or actually guitarists and even for folks like myself, we were of the same generation. Dweezil was intrigued by artists like Randy Rhodes. Absolutely. And Eddie Van Halen. Yes. And for those of you who recall some of his earliest works, um, you know, you can see a lot of those influences on the first releases that you had. Sure. Um, at the age of 12, he made his first onstage appearance with his father's band at the Hammersmith Odeon in London. Yep. And later that year, he recorded his first single, My Mother is a Space Cadet, and released on his father's Barking Pumpkin label in, two, in 1984. Uh, Dweezil contributed guitar solos to his father's album, Them or Us. And over the last 30 years, he has continued to record, tour, or collaborate with a wide variety of musicians, refining his own style while paying uh, tribute to the legendary work of his father. As an actor... You, you don't have to keep going, really. <laughs> you might remember some, some, some feature films as well as television. And, you know, and I didn't really think about it until I went through our little research. Yeah. I, at one point, I, I, you were an MTV VJ. Yep. All but kinds it, of stuff. <laughs> but anyways, please welcome to the QSC stage here at Winter Nam 2015, Mr. Dweezil Zappa. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. I know. Uh, Rachel, I got to meet you. I got to meet you. I've, I've heard you're uh, playing. You're, you're amazing. Yeah, I have not had a chance to see the movie that they've made about you, but I, uh, yeah, uh, in just a moment, I'm going to come in. You know what? I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to come shake your hand. There's, there's a girl over here who's an amazing musician, uh, and she has, um, there's a movie being made about her. Her name is Rachel Flowers, and she's, uh, she's excellent. So I've just got to meet her uh, just now. But you guys should all check her out if you can, because uh, she plays all by ear and plays amazing stuff and all the instruments herself. She's a maniac. It's like, what? Yeah. 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 All right, well, first of all, welcome to the QSC booth. Thank you. And um, is this your, I know you just got onto the show floor just a few yeah, minutes ago. Yeah, just, just made it by the skin of my teeth. Is this the first day you've actually been at the show? Yeah, you know, I have not been to NAMM uh, the past few years because we've been on tour. Uh, so this is the first time I've been back to NAMM in probably four years or so. And are you excited to be back? You get to yeah, connect with a lot totally of Yeah, it's totally different. They have food trucks and things outside, <laughs> you know, it's like... Before, you always had to have some decrepit hot dog and a terrible salad, you know, but now you have some other options. So that's probably the most exciting thing I've seen at NAMM so far. So far, but I, I assume you're probably going to walk around, take a look at all the gear. I definitely will, yeah. Uh, it used to be that it was all about guitars, but now it's about all kinds of other things, you know, that uh, are important to, because I do a lot of touring and I'm also doing a lot of music production stuff, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to look at from software to obviously you know, things like what we're talking about here today, the QSC stuff is all things that I use in the studio and, and particularly on stage. So, you know, it's, it's great to see what's out there and, and see what else you can do to just up 
whatever you do, get it to be the best that it can be. Sure, um, and, and I want to talk with you a little bit more uh, about that in a second, but uh, you, you said you haven't been here in four years. Um, you excited to be back? Did you, when you used to come, what was, the, what was the thing you looked forward to? When I first started coming, it was all about just every kind of guitar brand, and that was in the 80s, like, you know, 87, 88, 89, you know, so that was back in the days when it was uh, like Kramer guitar and Eddie Van Halen with, you know, a, a squad of police bringing him through the whole, you know, thing. And uh, so it was just cool because you could see musicians up close that you, you couldn't otherwise see. And, uh, and so it was a really cool thing to be near all this equipment and also see people that you really admired. Okay. Let's talk then a little bit about um, your, your experience using QSC products sure. along those lines. Uh, my first question is, so how did you discover QSC products and how did you start using them? Well, I started doing a lot of um, touring starting back in 2006 and originally I was using a, a guitar rig that was predominantly all analog kind of things, you know, amplifiers and effects pedals in these refrigerator size racks, you know, and it became really difficult to, to take that stuff on the road because it was really expensive and stuff tended to break because, you know, unless it's an air ride trailer and all this kind of stuff, you've got issues all the time. And, you know, if we had to fly somewhere, it, it just became really problematic. So I had to find a way to downsize my guitar rig. And I did that with uh, using Axe FX uh, processors, these um, digital guitar th things that are fantastic. So the size of the equipment went way down and also so did the stage volume because we, I didn't have speaker cabinets on stage anymore. And the, the whole purpose of switching to the digital processing was so that it would go directly to the front of house PA, bring the stage volume down and really improve the dynamics of the performance. And I needed something that would give me some stage spill um, so that not 100% of the sound was just coming from the PA. There had to still be something from the mm -hmm. stage. And that's when I started looking at different um, wedges that could produce the same kind of response that I would get from a guitar cabinet, but that were full range mm -hmm. and, and sounded like they had enough headroom to really deliver what you know was the guitar sound that I was wanting to have. And, and the QSC stuff, turned out to be the, the best answer for me. And the, the greatest thing about it too was that it was a well-known brand that I could find in other places in the world mm -hmm. in case something happened or I needed to borrow something or whatever. So it just became a, a great way to, to tour. What was there, um, was it always active loudspeakers that you were looking at when you were looking at wedges? Did you look at a variety of different Originally, things? Originally, you know, uh, when it became the new guitar system, it had to be a full range speaker that was uh, a powered speaker on its own, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I listened to a lot of different things and I immediately felt right at home with the QSC stuff because it would give me natural feedback and it, it just sounded like it translated from one environment to another. So if I was in the studio and I was listening to the studio monitors and checking the guitar sound, I could just turn those off and listen right directly into the QSCs and it sounded identical. So I could dial in the sounds either in a studio environment with wedges or from the, the QSC wedges directly. So that was a big help because you don't want to be chasing your tail, listening to one reference and then go to another and say, well, you know, this isn't translating. So it all worked really well. And, uh, and as I've continued to develop the, the, the system that I use to, to play guitar on stage, you know, the QSCs are, are a big part of it all the time just because I really do use them when I'm creating the sounds. So that's, that's the main active monitoring that I use to deliver the sound to me initially. Okay, great. So um, I believe you are using KW-122s, is that yeah. correct? Do you have yeah. any other products in that you've That's used? the stuff that I use, but I use four of them because I use two, um, two different, the, the system that I have is, is a parallel stereo rig. So I, I basically have two fractal axe effects that are programmed differently 
so that I can blend in different sounds with different pedals. And I have you know two stereo sets of, of speakers, but the outside ones are left and right wide, and then the inside ones are left and right. So I can get a variety of panning things uh, depending on how I make my presets. Okay, great. So um, arguably, you, you got some guys that help you out with production, but do you ever get stuck having to move stuff around on stage, or do you position stuff around on stage yourself? You know, the thing is, uh, we run a pretty tight ship. I'm my own guitar tech. I'm in there, you know, in the venues, moving stuff around and, and helping out with stuff. And when things break, you know, it's me that has to deal with it. So. So, and the reason I'm asking this is, you know, are, are you loading the trucks at times sometimes? Uh, I'm not really loading the trucks, you know, but uh, we, we do have a pretty small crew that gets it done. You know, we've got two guys that, uh, that basically are, are setting up and breaking down all the stuff uh, all the time. But they're, they have other jobs on the road as well. Sure. So, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot to, you know, the band is six people and then there's a three-person crew. So, it's a, it's a lot of people to take around the world. So so has uh, using KW, you know, you, you've talked about being able to re reproduce the sounds that you're after. Yeah. But I'm, I'm kind of right now, what's in my mind, I'm thinking about the guys that are out there humping the gear in and out of the truck, in and out of the venues. Are they thankful to you, shall we say, in any ways that maybe your rig's a little bit easier to move around? Absolutely. And set up? It's so much easier because you can put a bunch of stuff on a single dolly and move it around, you know, and... Uh, it's it's a lot less you know cumbersome than having four by twelve cabinets loaded with you know JBL speakers or different things that are super heavy, you know. Okay, um, let's talk for a minute about uh, give give us a little bit more detail. You you said it's uh, you got four wedges on stage. I'm just curious, and for those of you who haven't seen his setup, I uh, want to encourage you to go check out his website. It's got a great website with tons of detail on there. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get some of the pictures to show you live today, but I do yeah. want to see if you could tell us a little bit about how you actually have it all set up, because I think it's very interesting. It, it's going to change a little bit on this next tour, but still the, the predominant setup is that there's, there's two stereo sets of speakers, and I like to have the widest ones for the widest stereo, you know, the left and right on the outside, and then there's a, uh, the other two that are in the, the middle. So essentially it's like if you're at a mixing console and you want to do certain kind of panning i can put a clean sound right in the middle or like 10 and 2 and then i can put hard left and right a distorted sound and blend them all together and have all this clarity and separation and it, it sounds like you're in a studio you know it's it's great for all that kind of okay. stuff do you when you're recording and stuff are you that's still the same rig that you would mic up and yeah well i don't even have to mic it uh that's that's the thing because with the 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 fractal you can take the direct outs okay so in the studio i will i will listen on the qsc speakers to to get the sound uh and then when we actually record it i don't have to use the speakers in the studio environment, I could mic them up and get some sounds from the room that I'm in. But on stage, we never have to mic the speakers. They just are presenting the direct output of the, of the uh, fractals to the audience for the spill from the stage. Because if I didn't do that, you'd only hear me from the PA. And if you were in the front row in front of the speaker array, you'd hear my guitar from behind you. So you need something from the stage to give that that spatial representation. Okay, gotcha. Um, appreciate you, uh, all that good information about how you're using the QSC stuff, but arguably there's probably some folks wa watching on the webcast as well as here that probably want to know about some of the fun stuff. Um, and hopefully there's, there's going to be some interesting questions that are in my mind at the moment. Sure. Which is, um, let's talk or tell me about some of your early days playing. In particular, the, when you were 12 years old, you made your your performance day debut in London with your yeah. father. I was uh, 12. I've been playing guitar for nine months. <laughs> and my dad said, hey, do you want to come play on stage? And I said, yeah. I, I was terrified, of course, because the, the venue was the London Hammersmith Odeon, and it holds about maybe almost 6,000 people. So the first time I played in front of people, there were 6,000 people out there. And uh, the funniest part about it was there was a song called Stevie's Spanking, and that's the song that I played on that was written for Steve Vai, who was in my dad's band at the time. Anyway, 
the song was in the key of B, and I had only been playing guitar for nine months, and I didn't know how to play in the key of B. I could only play in the key of A. So uh, my dad made a hand signal for the band so that when he gave them the hand signal, he would modulate the song down to the key of A, and he brought me out on stage and said, my son, Dweezil, and then he just pointed to me, and so I had to play. And so I played for a little while, and then when I was done, he gave the band the hand signal to go back up to B, and then I walked off the stage, you know? <laughs> so it was like, he just made a quick adjustment, and it was like a magic trick. It was awesome. Did, did your father, did he push you, or did he let you kind of go at your own pace with your music work? You know, he, he never really uh, w decided to, to create some sort of... Uh, you know, system for me to, to study music or anything. He thought, yeah, if you like it, great, but it's a horrible business. You know, <laughs> you shouldn't get into it. You know, he sort of deterred me from it because, you know, it's, it's not an easy business to be in. And certainly the way he went about things, he did it in a very maverick style. Everybody said, no, that's not possible. And he said, you want to bet? You know, and so he basically just did it because he could manifest that stuff. He could see it. He could do it. He was a complete auteur. He knew how to make it all work. Uh, but, you know, it was a tireless effort for him to accomplish what he accomplished. And he, he just didn't want to see that happen to the kids. You know, he's yeah. like, oh, don't do that. Find something else. But that being said, like the only way for me to have rebelled in my family would have been to become an accountant or a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Noble professions. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. the Artists that were with us over the past couple of days, some of them were very musical family. They came from very musical families like Omar, Hakeem, and Rachel. Awesome. Um, then on the other hand, there were we had some folks stop by who, you know, their parents in, encouraged them to play music, but it wasn't really um, a, a big, you know, wasn't a big force on them. One of the questions that I've asked is with some of them that were came from musical backgrounds, it was just it was just they knew they wanted to do this and there was never an aha moment or there was never a um a moment where like hey i've I've reached a point where i've made it on for some there was they had those moments yeah. i'm gonna guess though and i could be wrong but you came from a very musical family your father is very yep. influential did you ever have a moment where you said wow i've i've accomplished something or was it just this is just what people did this was just what families did I, I think that for me it was I, I was always a fan of my dad's music I always listened to what he was working on and I didn't really hear any other music other than what he made or whatever he listened to recreationally at home so if he was listening to Johnny Guitar Watson or he was listening to the Bulgarian Women's Choir or whatever he was listening to that was the music that was in the house or whatever he was working on so you know for me when I got into uh, playing music I I didn't think I would be able to play the stuff that my dad did because it seemed way too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so the moment I started hearing other stuff on the radio, it was things like Van Halen and Queen and the Beatles. And, and, but it was only when I was 12 I started hearing other stuff on the radio. And I, then I got into playing guitar and I wanted to learn Eruption and all this mm -hmm. stuff from Randy Rhodes. And it, for me it was always just... Uh, I liked being a student of like trying to just get better at stuff, and it, it's never really changed. I never thought, hey, I've finally made it. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit. I know you do the uh, guitar boot camp, the guitar boot camp mm -hmm. workshops. Tell us a little bit about that. I have a camp that I do that's called Dweezilla. We've actually been on hiatus uh, from it uh, because I've been touring too much, uh, but we're going to get back to doing it. And I'm also doing some stuff with uh, TrueFire.com. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, filming some of my lessons that I do at, at my camp. But that all came from, you know, I started doing Zappa Plays Zappa. And uh, it was, for me, it was a, a question of just trying to give people a chance to hear my father's music presented in an authentic way, in a respectful way. And when people saw that, you know, the stuff we were playing was really all these challenging uh, compositions, people say, well, how did you learn all that stuff? Because uh, I don't actually read music. I'm not good with notation. I learn it all by ear. And um, a lot of it is really hard. Polyrhythms and crazy time signatures and, and other stuff, you know. Uh, just ask Rachel. She knows. She, <laughs> she learned all that stuff that way. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, the, the thing about it is 
so many people would ask, well, how did you do that? And, and so I said, well, uh, you know, I should maybe put together a little camp of some sort and, and, uh, and just give people some of the, the shortcuts that, that helped me change my guitar playing uh, and my abilities to learn this stuff and then be able to execute it. Because it, it took a, a four-year process of just listening to the music and doing a complete transformation of my approach to guitar before I even put the band together. Okay. You said you've you've been on hiatus for a couple of years and plans to come back this year, yeah. I understand? I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do it uh, in the fall, uh, but I, there's another uh, camp that I'm involved with, too, that's called the uh, Crown of the Continent Guitar Festival, and it's in Montana. And that's kind of a fun thing because my dad has the song Montana, and uh, so... I, 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 w I did something there last year, and we're doing some more there, and they have a scholarship that's a Frank Zappa scholarship. So, like, a student could win that and come to this week-long camp and learn from uh, a, a whole variety of other uh, different style teachers, and it's all guitar stuff. So, you know, I teach there and, and, and other people, but it's, it's a great event. Good. We're, we're getting close on time. It, hard to believe it already, but... There's musicians out in the crowd. I'm looking at a few of them that I know. Yeah. And, I, and I think we all like to know that our, for, forgive me for lack of a better word, our heroes have days like us. Is there a, uh, two questions, is there a gig that stands out in your mind as, wow, this is really memorable because it was great because, and then conversely, this, I remember this gig and this was the worst gig because, anything come to uh, mind? You know, I mean, I'm pretty much a live in the moment type of person, so you know we make the best out of whatever the situation is, and uh, so I wouldn't say that we've ever had a worst gig uh, situation. I've had things happen where equipment's broken right up until the moment you have to go on stage, and you have to somehow find a way to, you know, make it through a show. That's that's a lot of stress, and I don't like that kind of stuff, but uh, I still enjoy playing the music. So once the music starts, we just do the best we can with it, you know. But there's there's been so many rewarding experiences with all of it. The kind of stuff that I love is is when you see, uh, like, if, if people come to one of our shows and, and I'll see a kid that might be in the audience, you know, he might be, uh, I've done this a, a number of times, an 8, 10, 12-year-old kid. If they're close up front, you know, that's always amazing to me that uh, a young kid's coming to one of these shows to check out my dad's music. So I'll just pull them right up on the stage, and whether they play guitar or not, I put my guitar on them, and I make them play. You know, like I'll move their hands around, and I'll do kinds of stuff, and stuff like that is always fun. Oh, great! Living in the moment, I almost was going to take it that perhaps if we are living in the moment, this is maybe the best gig you've ever had with me. Totally <laughs> amazing. Hey, um, let's finish. What are you working on now? What's coming up next? I have a record of my own that I finally got a chance to start working on. It's been a long time since I've had a chance to do any of my own music because I've been so focused on the Zappa Play Zappa thing. But we have a, a pledge campaign, and that's been really fun because it's not just a, a thing that, that offers the opportunity for people to just support a project and fund a project. You get to be part of the project from the ground up. So if you go to the, the website and you look at it, uh, if, when people decide to pledge, there's videos from the very first day of, of making the record, and you're seeing what we're working on, how we're doing it, you know, the equipment, all these little things. There's, there's so much of an experience that, you know, if I was a kid and I got to see how a Van Halen record was made in that way, that would have been the most incredible thing. So it's this whole new way of making a record, and, and the people that have supported it from the ground up are um, there? I think most of them have pledged in a way. You see, because there's things you can you can get on there, like you get your name in the liner notes or all these things. The majority of the people that have pledged all want to have their name in the liner notes. So we're gonna have this booklet that's gonna have like <laughs> you know 600 people that have their names in there. But that kind of stuff is is uh, is great because it's you already have the support knowing that people want to hear this thing, uh -huh. you know, and it just changes the whole dynamic of, of what you do. So it's, a, it's an exciting time to be able to use technology to make a record and have people be a part of it from, from the beginning. And, uh, and it really changed how this record was uh, 
turned out. You know, I mean, there's there's some really great and uh, a lot of different variety of uh, styles on this thing, and and people get to see it on a daily basis. That's great. Well, we appreciate you stopping by the QSC booth here at Winter Thank NAM you. 2015. Um, thanks for everybody who watched us on our webcast, and for everybody who joined us today. Um, for all things Dweezil Zappa, you want to be sure to check out his website, which is dweezilzappa.com, correct? Dweezilzappaworld.com. Forgive me. Yeah. Forgive me. Dweezil Zappa World. But yeah. uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dweezil Zappa. Thank you.